would be right around the block, sometimes five, six people deep. We'd queue, by the time we got to the door, we'd talk to the security. Um, security would check our credentials, find that we were cool. We'd be let in, and then you would enter a kind of cavernous space with um, a chill-out area just off of the main dance floor. If I remember rightly, um, just outside of the chill-out area, there used to be a little cinema area where they'd be showing um, gay films because it was a gay club. And then once you pass through this cinema area, which was always dark, quite intimidating if you weren't used to it, there used to be a stairwell that used to lead up to a roof garden where the music was piped up to the stairwell, uh, or piped up to the top floor. So at about 11 o'clock midday, the, the next day, you'd be there sort of chilling after six, eight, maybe 10 hours of hardcore partying. And it'd be a wicked sensation to be sitting on that roof garden as the sun came up off the East River. Man, that was just living. That was the garage. more important than anything else, the reason why ultimately we parted company was the onset of the Acid House thing, where in the process of going to the States and kind of taking some of our punters out there, putting on a few parties and doing trips to New York, we all discovered the Paradise Garage and the kind of joy of house music. And for me, it was a kind of all transforming experience where I think the kick drum became more significant in my own kind of musical lexicon than, than the bass line. And I found my own taste changing and I got more and more involved in residencies which were house orientated, which kind of rendered our parties, um, I wouldn't say musically redundant, but like they'd had their time. An awful lot of the people who were originally into Rare Groove moved over and started finding kind of fresh energy and fresh enlightenment in the burgeoning acid house rave, starting with hedonism, moving into the much bigger events. The early days at Shum was crazy. Ah, crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> It was smoke machine, and um, Danny would tell me to bring a lot of equipment in there, you know, like bass bins. He said, Joey, I want it powerful. So I'd bring a lot of equipment in there, and, you know, you get people sitting in the curve of the bass bin while the music's being played. And it was just crazy. You couldn't even see your hands in front of your face. Well, Danny was thinking of starting a club roughly along the same lines or the same times I was thinking of starting High and Hope. I can remember when we were both promoting our opening nights, we were both standing outside um, the Astoria, Nicky Holloway's, The Trip, which is weird really, both giving out flyers in the rain. If anyone's got a picture of that, mate, they'd be amazed, you know, a couple of London's biggest DJs, country's biggest DJs, actually flagging and promoting their own night. But I can remember standing in the rain with Ramplin outside the Astoria, giving out flyers for our respective clubs. But anyway, um, Danny told me he was starting um, a night at the fitness centre and 
he mentioned that Carl Cox, yeah, the legendary Carl Cox, would be supplying the sound. And Carl was bringing up his sound system all the way from Brighton to put in the fitness centre at Southwark. So I thought, well, OK, no, no chance to get the sound in there then. But anyway, as it turned out, Carl's sound system broke down on, on Danny's opening night, <laughs> which was um, fortunate for us because the very next day I saw Danny somewhere, I think in Camden, in the market. And he said, um, do you think Joey would put the sound into, um, into the fitness centre? And I thought, well, boy, would we? Didn't need asking twice. So I said to Joey that Danny wants to um, put the sound into uh, this fitness centre, not knowing, not having any idea what this place was like. And then Joey put it in there and it became the resident sound system, you know, behind Shump probably one of the most important clubs in, in clubbing history. Drugs changed everything. You know, people who, who were, were standing in the corner, you know, nodding their heads in a nice sort of black jacket and a little 70s cap, you know, were standing on tables and acting like idiots. You know, drugs changed everything. And for better or for worse, you know, they've changed things for good, I think. Initially, it was done through love. I remember going to a rave called Hedonism, which a lot of people tell you was a turning point. And I'm so glad I went there because it was actually funk boys that, that kind of were instrumental in that rave. It was the same boys we, we always talk about. You know, Norman was there, Jazzy was there, his sound system was being used, you know, the sound systems were being used. But the DJ, the DJ and then the music played was house music, mainly. And we all loved house music at the time. We thought it was the next step, obviously. It was another version of what we were doing. I don't think I'd ever have abandoned my roots, but I found it really exciting. All the stuff on tracks, um, the bad production, you know, just clinging on to a sort of groove, and it was different. And we did this rave, we went to this rave hedonism, dressed normally, decided there's only one way to dance. Everyone's dancing a certain way. And then coming out completely drenched and looking like crap. So I think everybody decided to dress down the next time they did one. I'm not saying it was the start of that scene, but for us it was the first experience I ever had. And it was out somewhere in Alperton, on the skirts of London. And um, that was it when it was innocent. Music that's good for your soul 
away to New York for a couple of weeks on holiday. One of the, the uh, meetings where they were basically allocating the new sites uh, were, were, was taking place in my absence. So I sent Joey to one of them, to the meeting, to make sure we, we get, you know, a good site. Now, unknown to me, um, Joey wanted to move closer to Parish Square, <laughs> and I wanted to move away from Parish Square. So in my absence, um, Joey was allocated a site right on Ledbury Road, just around the corner from Parish Square, Talbot Road. Remember outside the pub? Where one of those traditional reggae sound systems was playing. And when I called up Joey from New York, have we got a new site? He said, yeah, you'll love it. Uh, I thought, great, trust my brother's judgment. I get back, and to my horror, I discover it's on Ledbury Road or just in, okay, and I went absolutely crazy. I went, no way, I'm not playing it, it's not happening. Joe, if you want to do carnival, you do it on your own, you remember that? And we had our first kind of fallout. I was adamant, there's no way. I said, I can't, I leave you to the meetings and you come back with this. And I was going mad, but, you know, with benefit of hindsight, if we'd have continued the sound as Great Tribulation, perhaps the Ledbury Road site would have been perfect. But it wasn't. You know, Joey took me around, we went around there that very day I got back, we drove around, we looked around, and I went, no, this isn't right for this reason and that reason. It was on the corner of a road. Um, your boxes and speakers were on the pavement, no protection. And again, you're on a thoroughfare where people don't come there because of you. They're walking past anyway. So that's no way of securing a crowd or, or doing it right. And I remember I was blowing up, going mad. So I said, right, get in the car. I said, what other sites have they, gave, have they got an offer? I said, what about the new sites, you know, towards Kensal Road. Let's go and have a look. So uh, we rushed up to the Sainsbury site at the top of Ladbrook Grove. I ran in the carnival office. Who, I said to Claire, you know, the organiser, I said, Claire, who's got the site by Sainsbury's? She goes, oh, you've missed it by a day. Mastermind have claimed it. Oh, fuck. Yeah, Mastermind have got it. And I went and looked at the site, and I just, you know, when you have this vision, I just visioned the sound system at the end of the cul-de-sac, and I thought, great. You know, no one will disturb us here. And the whole point of moving away from the, the center of Carnival was that if we were really any good, then our fans would move with us. And that way, we'd be rid of all the dead wood. We'd be away from all, any potential um, trouble spots. We'd probably get less hassle from the police. And there was a million really positive reasons why we should move away from uh, the Good Time site. So, I can remember driving around in the days thinking, oh, we fucked it up. We'll never get a spot in Carnival now. We're too late. And then I drove down um, West Row off of Kensal Road. I was looking around. We were on our way to Horniman's Pleasance or somewhere like that, the park. And we stopped off at the junction of West Row and South Row. And I looked on the corner and there was a little precinct, little corner there. And I turned around to Joe and I went, this is it. This is absolutely perfect. And Joe was like, oh, no. No one will ever find us here. We're so secluded. It's a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, Joey, please, trust me. This is where we have to move to. DJs have the best seat in the house. You see, you see it all from the first person who walks in to the last person who goes and you see people getting together, you see people meeting. I used to watch people as a, as a part of my hobby when I was in between playing records. I used to just watch people get together and I was, bet he's going to get together with her, bet he's going to chat her up. And you could see it. You could see people meeting, you could see friendships forming. And I don't know, people just took each other. It didn't matter what you did for a living, when you're in a club, it's just, it, it's just it's the status quo is there, you know. You know, there's no getting away from it when there's someone and there's people like normal up up, up front saying what they're saying in the way that, they, that he says it, which is with no compromise. It changed, it, it helps to change things. Mm -hmm. 